Um, welcome everyone to the Trees for Trips grant program webinar. My name is Mary Hegarty. I'm the statewide coordinator for the Trees for Trips program. The Trees for Trips program uh, has been working since 2007 to reforest New York's tributaries. And it's a program of the New York State Nursery in Saratoga. And there's a link to um, the, the nursery there. And the Trees for Trips has engaged about 10,000 volunteers since 2007, has planted about 106,000 trees and shrubs, and about 625 sites across New York State. So a lot of you here are riparian buffer specialists already. Some are new to riparian buffers. Um, as we know, this is a list of riparian buffer ecosystem services. And this list of services is really why we are here today, creating and restoring riparian buffers. So just a, a list there. And nice example of a treed buffer along a river. Uh, my favorite, one of my favorite uh, benthic macroinvertebrates, stoneflies. They like, obviously, clean, cool, flowing streams. So as we're helping the benthic macroinvertebrates, we're helping the fish, and ultimately we're helping the whole ecosystem, the whole stream ecosystem. So again, just a brief history, and then we'll get right into the grant. The Trees for Trips program was established in 2007 by the Hudson River Estuary Program. Beth Rossler is the uh, coordinator for that program. It's a great program. The, the state noticed what a great program it was, and there were some major flooding events that happened, 2011, 2012, and the program began to expand statewide in 2011. And by 2014, there was a dedicated, there was and is a dedicated state environmental protection fund funding line in, in our budget. Volunteers are critical to our program success, and that's the uh, that's a SUNY Cobalt skill there. And this one at the bottom, you'll see a nice uh, progression of, of planting, pre-planting, planting day, and then a next a year later, and that's in um, that was in Albany County. Here's a photo of the Hudson River Estuary Trees for Trips program of planting in Rockland County. Volunteers again are a big part of our success. Okay, so let's jump in. If you hear my paper crinkling, I'm just kind of looking at my notes, making sure I don't miss anything. <laughs> so, okay, so we've got our round one. This is the first time we're offering it a grant program. The deadline is Friday, September 7th at 3 p.m. All questions are due by Friday, August 17th by 3 p.m. We will be uploading the questions and answers periodically, probably about weekly, so don't forget to check them. Um, the reason we do that is to make sure everyone has fair access to all the questions, so the grant is fairly um, rolled out. So that's why they're, that you're, asked, you're asked to email me questions so that I can record them, and then I'll answer the questions on our Q&A document. And then, like I said, that will be uploaded on the Grants Gateway and also on our grant program webpage. And we're hoping to announce awards by early to mid-December. So if you've perhaps printed out the RFA or you have it on another, you can, you can look at it alongside, because we're basically today just going to follow along the RFA. And you can open it or follow along on, your, on a paper copy. Here's the links, just so you have them. And so we'll go over the main points today, but uh, as we remind people, always read the full RFA. There's the front page of the RFA, and we'll just dive right in. So for funding, on page eight, we've got, um, there's approximately 525,000 available. Applicants can request a minimum of 11,000 and a maximum of 100,000. Applicants should submit one application only, but planting projects can be in one or more watersheds, and it can be included into a single application. The time frame is within a two-year contract term. The eligible project locations are, this is the map from Appendix 1, so I'll talk about that. 
pretty much all watersheds are eligible for this grant. The only two that are not eligible are the Hudson River Estuary Watershed and the New York City DEP Drinking Watershed, which is west of Hudson. Um, and the reason for that is because they already have their own riparian buffer programs in place. And so will you know, anyone on this call today, you're not eligible for this if you're in those watersheds. And um, yeah, I would direct you to those two websites, either Beth Rossler at the Hudson River Estuary Watershed um, Trees for Trips program and the West of Hudson New York City DEP Watershed, which is the um, Catskill Buffer Initiative. And um, I can take questions about that later too. All right. And so you can, for project locations, you can implement projects on public or private land. And it's just, we're asking if you do do it on private land that you show a public benefit. Explain that in your application. If a project is on New York State land that is allowed, but the applicant cannot be a New York State agency, it can be a nonprofit, such as a Friends of a Park, for example. Project locations, again, describe the location of your project site, include photos and maps, um, showing the site and your planting goals for each site, and upload a map for each project, clearly identifying the project site and identify it by location into the Grants Gateway. We don't want hand-drawn maps, but you can create a screenshot of a map and then you can like draw some things by hand, but we want and uh, we don't want drawn maps. And there's other places to get aerial images. There's Google Maps, Google Earth, et cetera. You can also view ortho images on that link there and our riparian assessment um, map, which we're going to talk about briefly a little later. So you can also get maps from there. Okay. Here's our slide. So this, um, we're wanting to you to remember um, when you're uploading your maps or any documents, if you have multiple project sites, make sure you upload each project map into one PDF. What happens is if you upload uh, multiple PDFs, it overwrites and it'll erase the first one. And we've actually had quite a few people um, become ineligible because they don't have the correct number of documents and they don't realize that something was overwritten and erased. So this is part of why we have this game because we want you to remember to upload it, you know, a few documents into a single PDF for each question in the application. Okay, so our eligible applicants are municipalities, not-for-profits, and academic institutions. and. If you're a watershed group that isn't a 501c3 or a nonprofit, you could um, apply through a, a designated lead, like a municipality or academic, a college, university, or a not-for-profit. Municipality, I won't get too into this, just defined as city, town, conservation district, Indian nation. Um, it's all described in the RFA, the request for application, so just look for that. Academic institution, it's any institution um, that's, not, that's not for profit. Um, and then we have the other applicant, eligible applicant is not for profit, so if you have a 501c3 status. And there's no match requirement for this grant. And um, the local needs is to show a local need, so grants that show significant improvement to water quality, wildlife, habitat, and or climate resiliency, you'll get more points in the evaluation if you address all three. And sites should be selected using our recommended minimum standards document. It's under, it, that, that's in appendix two. So be sure to read through that appendix, or read through all the appendixes, but there's quite a good amount of detail in that um, standard for how to um, site, select sites, et cetera. So local needs, again, as outlined in appendix two of the RFA, um, the sites should be need, must be repairing areas. 
Um, that includes any areas within the floodplain or within 300 feet of a stream. A planting area that is separated, though, by a road or structure, a stormwater pond, or man any other man-made structures, that's not going to be eligible if it's separated. Um, buffers along lakes, ponds, and wetlands may be considered. And applicants should definitely strive for 35 feet or wider of a, of a buffer. They, the latest studies are 100 feet is really the best. So, but we're aiming, you know, we're encouraging 35 feet, and if you do wider, that's, that's even better. Um, yeah. So again, with the planting plan, if you're following along on the RFA, page 9 and 10 of the RFA refer to Appendix 2, again, that minimum standards of how to, um, for, the, for planting projects. And Appendix 5, we have a, a planting plan to follow, for you to follow. The planting plan grants projects must include individual planting plans for each project. And they should include native species and um, New York native species, trees and shrubs. And the planting plans must include professional guidance, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. And it's also on page 10 described there. And we're also encouraging applicants to use New York seed source stock whenever possible, and you will receive more points doing so. Um, people have been asking where to purchase trees and shrubs. We're encouraging you to use the New York State Saratoga Tree Nursery. Some of you have already done that in the past. We also encourage you to use local nurseries that specialize in native, native plants and New York seed source. Stock. <laughs> and so just remember to be sure to ask when you get your quotes from nurseries where their seed source is from. Again, we want New York seed source whenever, whenever possible. So professional guidance, you must submit a letter showing professional guidance was received from a New York State DEC forester, a certified arborist, or a natural resource professional. And we've got on page 10, moving on to partner support, uh, with you'll get more points with partner projects. So partner projects are encouraged. Um, proposed projects that build partnerships will receive more points, as I said. Okay. Oh, oh I lost our remember slide. Hang on. <laughs> okay. So the remember slide, again, this is a reminder. We just talked about partner support letters. If you've got a few, make sure you put them all into one PDF. All right, so the maintenance plan. So maintenance is really important with our plantings. Um, a lot of times it gets neglected, so this is an important part. Uh, make sure you're going back and checking on your trees. We want to make sure that they survive and that they are doing well. Of course, there's always going to be some loss and so you want to have a plan for replanting and replacing. So applicants, including a maintenance plan for each project site, will receive more points in their evaluation. Um, we want to know who on your staff or within your organization will be providing long-term maintenance and um, that, they'll, they'll be, that, that you have the capacity to follow up. And again, Referring to Appendix 2, there's discussion about maintenance plans there. And we also have a sample maintenance report in Appendix 6, and that can be used as a guide. I'm going to talk about that a little more. Our website also has nice guidance on maintenance. We have a, a site maintenance guide booklet, and you can look at that on our website. There's the link. And moving on to page 11 of the request for application, page 11. So the work plan is basically the canvas for the project. You want to map out the what, the who, the when, the how, all that. And this is, gives you the overview. The work plan must include anticipated time frames in meeting various objectives, tasks, deliverables. And Jeff will talk a little bit about this after I speak as well. When you go into the Grants Gateway, he'll get into this. You go to the Forms menu and the pre-submission uploads. I don't want to, when he gets into it, you'll, you'll understand that better. 
Okay, so this is on the Grants Gateway. This is what the worksheet looks like. This is the guide to help you answer those questions. This is not something that you have to submit, but it's to help you be organized. There's the objectives, the tasks, the performance measures. That's the worksheet, but that, again, will help you organize your work plan. All right. Outreach and education and volunteer engagement. So projects should definitely, we're looking to have projects that provide education to communities about planting and repairing buffers, restoring them, expanding them, um, and all about the ecosystem services that buffers help and provide for our stream ecosystems. And you'll receive more points if you include this. And then volunteers also, you'll get more points with that, um, with your evaluation. So include volunteers is really important. The volunteers have always been a big backbone of the Trees for Trips program. Cost effectiveness, you will be evaluated on cost effectiveness. This is mentioned on pages 11 and 14 of the RFA. You want to upload three competitive nursery quotes. Um, and you'll receive more points if you do if you do one or two, that's fine, but you'll get the most points if you do three. And again, here's our remember slide. When you're putting in those three quotes, again, be sure to put it into one PDF. Sorry to keep banging this forward, but we want you to not forget, because like I said, it's happened where people have been disqualified because they didn't have the right documents or the, yeah. Okay, so moving on, pages 11 and 14, again, we're still on cost effectiveness. There's check the eligible and non-eligible items in the RFA, it's pages 23 to 24. And project cost effectiveness will account for at least 20% of an application score as identified in the evaluation criteria section of this RFA, so just make sure you read through that. And as I mentioned at the beginning, We've got um, a Q&A, which will be posted on our grant website and also in the Grants Gateway. There's the deadline again, and again, we do this for fairness so that everyone has the advantage of seeing the questions and the answers. For technical information, this is on page 12. Get advice from your forester. You can use this link to find your forester. And if you're looking for a certified arborist, here's another link to find arborists in your area. So project eligibility criteria and information, pages 2, 12 to 13. The objective of our grant is to increase trees and shrubs planted along priority riparian areas throughout New York State. If there are sites that you might be working on that might be already getting federal or state funding for specifically for riparian activity in the same location, that's not eligible. If it's, if you're, one program that's common is the Federal um, Conservation Reserve Program, the CREP, um, that's, if you're, if you're already getting that, you can't get funding from ours, ours. If you have questions about this, you know, it might, you might have a, pro a project going on that's a, a little, that's not near the riparian buffer, so you might still be eligible. So just ask about that. Project type, page 13. Applications should address the benefits of planting trees and shrubs and how, how your project will benefit wildlife habitat, water quality, climate resiliency. This was mentioned earlier. The project applications must include detailed maps and photos labeled. We need proof of land ownership in the form of tax parcel numbers. We would like a municipal endorsement if needed if you're on municipal land or a letter of agreement with the landowner. So those are in Appendix 3 and 4. And also a plant list of the New York native species, trees and shrubs. And page 14, project timeline, partners, knowledge, skills, and experience. Applicants must provide a timeline. Um, just be sure that you're within the two-year contract term and that you have tasks that are reasonable that can be completed within a two-year term. 
And for multiple partner and intermunicipal projects, we want letters of commitment to from each partner. So, and there would be a designated lead if you had a multiple partners, you want to make sure there's a, a lead within your partnerships. And then each applicant must have a team or at least a few staff that are knowledgeable, have the skills and or a track record of implementing a project successfully. And these are kind of, you know, important or in any kind of on the ground projects. You always want to check for um, any kinds of seeker determinations, permits, any kinds of approvals, easements, rights of way that you might need to carry out a project in the, the planting and the riparian area. Always call dig safely to determine if there's any underground utilities, so that's important. Letters of agreement, page 14. Um, again, those are in appendix three and four. So you can go there to get those. And if you have a bunch of letters of agreement, or because you'll have a few, you might have a few projects. Again, here's our remember slide. Um, remember to put them all, all your letters of agreement or municipal endorsements into one PDF. And here's a nice photo of our volunteers planting, just to break up the monotony. <laughs> Um, okay, so additional application requirements and information. Now we're on to page 15 of the, R, of the RFA if you're following along. Expenditure-based budget applicants must complete an itemized budget in the New York State Grants Gateway that provides details of the proposed, your proposed project and the related expenses. Um, the work plan we talked about a little bit already. Um, must com you must all everyone must complete a work plan in the gateway, and it must provide clear overview of the project. We talked about this already, but just following through the RFA, there's the worksheet again to help you guide you in your work plan, the big picture. Um, and on page 16, application evaluation, scoring, and selection. Minimum eligibility, there's a pass-fail criteria. I'm not going to go through all the points, but make sure you read this very thoroughly. All questions must be a pass, so, or your entire application will be declined. So that, this is a really important piece. Double check your work before submitting. And again, you, you must have all questions must be a pass, or your, thing will, your application will be de declined. Uh, also, project technical, so under the, oh, so then this is the pages 17 to 21 where you've got the um, reviewers will be evaluating you on various questions. So again, I'm not going to go through each question on that, but make sure you um, read through them. You know, there's the questions on local needs, project location, have you done New York Seed Source, past performance? Buffer width, are you getting a, you know, maintenance plan? So all those, so make sure those pages are read through very thoroughly and you'll be based on, your score will be based on that criteria. That's after you hit the pass. So you have to do the pass fail first evaluation and then you will be scored on the, these following pages. And evaluation question, so, so applicants will be individually evaluated by several reviewers. Watch your character count and understand the level of desire, the, the level of detail that we want. And generally, more is better. Give us more detail so us, the reviewers, can get all the details. And think through your project carefully with your partners and devise a work plan together. Application evaluation and method of award, page 22 of the RFA. The applications are grouped into the following three lists, Great Lakes Priority Watershed Area, the Mohawk River Priority Watershed Area, and the Statewide Priority Watershed Area. See page 22 for more details on that. Um, and, oh, this is a nice, we did a farm in Madison County 
the, um, the Upper Susquehanna Soil and Water Conservation District Coalition in April of 2017. Nice picture here of 265 trees planted. And moving on to page 23 of the RFA, we've got our statewide riparian opportunity assessment tool. The Natural Heritage Program created an assessment tool that was completed this spring, and it's a, one, it's a great tool, and we, um, we're going to I'll t have a few talk a little bit about it. Um, it can help you identify planting sites. So these are the links to the tool itself. And you can go into this data explorer and there's an actual tour that you can take again on page 23. And I'm pleased to have Amy Conley who developed this program, this tool. Um, here, she's with us right now. She's going to show us really briefly a little bit about the tool. And um, so you can use, again, you use this tool. We're encouraging you to use it to help you pick, prior, to prioritize sites in your watershed. So thank you, Amy, for coming. Hello, everyone. I am Amy Conley. Uh, uh, so this is uh, the homepage for the riparian assessment that New York Natural Heritage developed uh, with Trees for Kids specifically in mind. Uh, there's also a link to this web page on the Trees for Trids DEC page in case you have trouble finding your way back to it. It's mynhp.org slash trees for trids my. And you can access um, all of the, the ways that we displayed the results for you from this page. Uh, you can also on this page, uh, there's a link right here to a recording of a webinar that we did on April 19th, um, which is about an hour where we go into a lot of detail on how we developed the tool and different ways to use it. Um, but the goal of this, of this tool is that you can use it to prioritize areas for plantings in your sub-watershed, or if you have a site already in mind, you can use this tool to understand a little more about its context, you know, what the habitat is like in that area, what are some of the specific um, ecological stresses that are occurring where you might want to plant, um, to give you a lot more information to make a decision about uh, where you want to do your, your project. And so the main page has a quick overview of the, the project in general. I'm not going to go too much into it other than to explain that the way we did the assessment was we essentially looked at a whole lot of different factors that influenced riparian health. So we looked at uh, potential for erosion, we looked at the kind of land cover that's in the area, um, canopy cover, is it natural, um, is it impervious surface. We looked at other kinds of connectivity stressors like dam storage ratio, whether or not there were, you know, light, nice intact floodplain complexes. And so when I'm going to show you our products, you're going to see that you can either look at any one of these individually. If you're especially interested in water quality, we have a couple of indicators that especially look at where are the known water impairments that the Division of Water has found in my area that might influence um, where I want to plant. Um, we have sort of a very, we use all of these indicators to create sort of a single score that gives you an overall view of the health of your habitat, but you can also make it as detailed as you want. You can look at any one of these individually. And when I'm talking about that, this menu on the left that sort of travels with you when you scroll up and down um, our data has got a quick link to uh, all the data is downloadable, if you would like, including our project report, which has a great deal more detail on how we developed this, um, including some examples uh, at the end of the report, including a, this is example for filling out a Trees for Trips uh, application for some um, examples of how you might use it. But all of our products are online. So you can access them without having to download. Um, and the, there's uh, two online maps of the subwatershed and the catchment map and the data explorer. So we're hopefully, that's the explorer. Where is the subwatershed map? So the subwatershed map, um, these are ArcGIS online maps. Um, if you're familiar with them, it's made mostly point and click. Uh, this is, oops, hopefully you'll zoom in. Uh, but this map, if you'll see, there's sort of this gradient from blue to red across the whole state. So on the subwatershed, which is um, the HUC-12, if you're familiar with those kind of uh, divisions, 
they're ranked relative to all the other sub-watersheds in the state, which is why you know, the Adirondacks is dark blue, meaning they have essentially the higher scoring ecological health factors and very few ecological stress, and that's why Long Island is, is slightly red. So starting here is a, good, is a good place if you want to put your area in sort of a statewide context. And you can find out more about any area by clicking on it. It's mostly a point and click interface. So once you click on a, uh, a sub watershed, you'll get the score. Um, you will get a nice description here of what we mean by the comprehensive score. Uh, and if you're interested in, you know, trying to figure out, okay, well, you know, my area is blue. What's contributing to that? If you click through uh, down. Below, it will show you sort of what are the major ecological health or stress um, components that we assess that are contributing to its relative you know, status to the rest of the state. In this case, this has a lot of um, high scores for most of our health indicators and you know, only two real major stress indicators. There's you know, a minor topographic wetness index. Um, if you want to break this down further, all of these layers, you can select them by um, turning them on and off. Uh, so if you just want to look at how uh, the ecological health scores look um, separate from ecological stress, you can turn that one on. We also have um, resilient score, which is based on some work that the Nature Conservancy did, um, looking at habitat uh, resilience to climate change. Uh, and down here, so you keep scrolling, you can see all of the individual uh, scores. So if you're really interested in, let me turn this one off, say uh, native fish richness, uh, which we developed, this is a, you can turn that one on and just look at, at that score individually. Um, and then again, clicking on any of the sub watersheds will bring up more detailed information about what the score is, how it was calculated, um, and links to uh, more information. Now, if you already know the general area where you're going to be working in and you kind of want to prioritize sites within that region, uh, you can look at the, oops, the sharing screen thing means I can't see the new tab. There you go, the catchment map. I think the first thing to notice is it looks a little bit like a stained glass window. That is because on the catchment map, we basically only rank these catchments within their sub-watershed. The idea being is once you've narrowed down where you want to work to sort of one of the sub-watersheds, which were those units we saw on the other map, every sub-watershed goes from red to blue, so it shows you for any individual score which are the relatively highest and lowest scoring sites. There's some additional special features here, um, depending on uh, where you work, that will filter out catchments that are just in urban areas. Or if you just want to, you know, you know your project, you're limited to working on public or um, protected land, taking a little bit to load up. But what this will do is it'll gray out any catchments that don't qualify. And then if you click on it, um, it should say, I'll give you the score. No, I don't think it's loaded yet. And then it will tell you, okay, this particular catchment intersects these two were preserved. Um, these are based on the, the New York Protected Areas database. So there's some additional information that we can provide once we get down to this smaller level. Um, it has all the same scores that you saw before. Um, one additional feature that uh, you can't get on the sub watershed map is uh, if you want to know what kind of water quality impairments are going on in this area, we were able to use, the Division of Water gave us a really nice breakdown of their uh, prairie water bodies inventory list. And so in addition to telling you about how many known water impairments uh, specific to kind of riparian buffers there are, it, uh, we're also able to pull out additional data that might be of interest for some projects if you want to particularly look at protecting certain kinds of waters, and it tells you the kinds of impairments. So in this case, construction, stream bank erosion, urban storm runoff are the ones we're concerned with. There's also some combined sewer overflow 
So it gives you a little more detailed data that you don't get on the subwatershed map. So the, both the maps are very good places to look for finding information about describing what's going on on the ground. Our uh, data explorer is this online tool that's a nice way to put where you're working in context. And uh, it has the exact same information, it's just uh, displayed a little differently. Um, it is accessed from the main start page again, uh, just like the map. And what it allows you to do is you see the same kinds of scores that you see on the maps, but you also see the subwatersheds ranked here uh, spatially. So each point on this plot represents a subwatershed, and their positions reflect their scores. So if you want to really quickly identify, say you're working in uh, the, where's a small one? The upper Delaware. Uh, and you want to focus on areas that are maybe you're doing preservation, you want to work on areas that are doing the best, you can select this upper left quadrant. These are areas that have ecological health scores that are at or above the average, and they have lower than average stress. And so that's hard to see from just looking at the map, but using the, uh, the ranking tool, you can drag on the plot and see them on the map. What I also like for this tool in particular that you can't really do with the maps, it's very useful for prioritizing the middle. Um, that sometimes gets lost when you rank according to one variable. For example, there might be areas like here in the lower left where their health scores are, oops, their health scores are slightly lower than average, but their stress scores are also lower than average, meaning a little work in this area might bump them up into this kind of this happy quadrant here. So this might be prioritize good areas to, to work in that are kind of less at risk of being overwhelmed by whatever ecological stresses are going on. Um, but they're the same color, they're all the same color orange, so when you use the tool it allows you to pick out those that are orange for sort of the right reasons. Um, if you are interested in where a particular uh, subwatershed ranks, the, uh, the maps are interactive, so when you click on it, uh, it'll highlight where that subwatershed falls. Um, and it also shows you this nice little snapshot on the bottom, which uh, this is the upper little Delaware River, and it shows you all of its scores in one view, which is hard to do on the map. You have to sort of turn the layers on and off. So if you're not sure, you know, you don't have a particular indicator, you're not really focused on native fish, you're kind of just interested in what's going on in general, looking at these plots will show you all of the scores for the health are represented by these bars. And the little vertical bars show kind of the average for the state of New York. So anywhere the bar is a little left um, means, okay, it's slightly lower than average. And anywhere the bar extends past means it's doing better than average. So here, um, this is biological assessment profile. Uh, this is an indicator of water quality that the Division of Water does based on the invertebrates they find. And this is a really high biological assessment profile. This is good water quality. Um, and it has higher than average like natural cover and riparian canopy cover. Oh, actually canopy cover, but it has a little lower than average riparian canopy cover. Maybe that might be a good place to plant some trees on the stream and bump it up. And frankly, it has really low, you know, stress scores. It has little to no impervious surface, a lot of dam storage ratio, some erosion risk. Uh, you can also, um, there's a, I'll show you quickly. Now once you've clicked on one of these, you can go over to the catchments tab and it will provide you all the same tools, but now we're just prioritizing the catchments within that subwatershed. So you can go through the exact same process of looking for uh, whichever areas you want to work in. Um, you can also uh, change, you know, if you're interested in a particular score, you can uh, uh, change the colors based on that. Uh, there's a lot you can do with this. I will point out one, two things that in case you've forgotten, because you're not like me and haven't worked with this for three years, what each of these, you know, categories means. We have this indicator tab, so if you're going to go in and you want to know, okay, what does resilience mean, it'll, you can quickly pull out um, the definitions and the calculations and you can, uh, to learn what we're talking about. Also, there is this take a tour tab, um, which my colleagues were very happy to, well, 
there's cooperative in demoing. And basically, it will take you through all of the features of the Data Explorer. Not only tells you what they are, uh, but it also has some uh, little, uh, basically, interactive things. So it'll, give, it'll basically walk you through using it and showing you different ways uh, to interpret what you're seeing and different ways to help it use you to uh, use it to make decisions. So hopefully this is a great way to put either an area you interested in working in in context or really um, digging down and identifying an area based on, on some specific criteria. Uh, but uh, if you have, again, any specific questions, our report is found on the main page. It has a lot of detail. Um, and there's um, a lot of information in those pop-up windows on the maps and in the, uh, the description file in the Data Explorer. So on page 23, 24 of the RFA, we have the eligible grant reimbursement costs. Go through this. We've got personal services, contractual, travel, equipment, and other is the cost of the trees, shrubs, tree tubes, weed mats. We have, um, we see many benefits of having this become a grant program, and one I'll just mention is that in the past, people have said, oh, we, you know, we want to do this, but we don't have staff time or extra time in our day. So now with this grant, you are eligible to be reimbursed for your staff time to work on, pro on riparian buffer projects. So that's, that's one, one of the benefits of becoming a grant program. So we're excited about that. So those are the eligible reimbursement costs. So again, make sure you go through those, rever uh, review them in detail. And then again, with page 24, um, what's not eligible is indirect overhead, travel, certain types of travel. Travel is eligible to the location site. Um, equipment, vehicle fuel is not eligible. Um, application preparation is not eligible. And anything of the, any cost incurred before the contract start date or after the contract end date is not eligible. So when you're consulting um, to, with a professional for maintenance, for the planting plan, the maintenance plan, and the stuff that you need to apply, you could focus on reaching out to the regional foresters and perhaps an arborist you could reach out to later for maybe perhaps help with maintenance and any other advice. That would be my suggestion. Okay, and then we're moving on. Also, page 24, if we have a priority within our grant to help environmental justice areas. So here's the link to find out if you are in an environmental justice area, and you will score higher points if your proposed project is located in an environmental justice community or will directly benefit an environmental justice community. And on to our appendices. We've got Appendix 1, that is the map of our eligible watersheds. Appendix 2 is the one I mentioned to read very carefully. It's the recommended standards for planting in riparian areas. These standards include, within this document, we've got planning, we've got plant species selection guidance, site selection guidance, planting standards, and maintenance planning. Appendix 3, sample municipal endorsement. Um, and then we've got Appendix 4 is the letter of agreement with the landowner. This agreement would be between a landowner and the grantee to allow the grantee to do the riparian planting on the property owned by the landowner. Appendix 5 is our planting plan. You must submit a planting plan by, by, with the help of a certified professional. Um, you don't have to use this template, but we encourage you to. Um, so there's a planting plan for you to refer to in Appendix 5. Appendix 6, again, maintenance is really important. It often gets forgotten. You know, everyone gets excited about the tree planting, and then it um, sometimes gets forgotten that we've got to get back to the sites and check on them. So we've got, um, we do require that you have a maintenance plan in place. So there's a sample maintenance report. This report is actually 
not something you'd submit to us. This is something, it's a, it's a nice checklist that you would take out in the field with you on a clipboard and just make sure you're covering your bases. So that's what this um, sample report is on, in Appendix 6. And we've got the last time our remember slide. <laughs> So again, don't be the applicant that has to be rejected for not having all your documents into one PDF. And um, that's, that's the last reminder. <laughs> um, and it's part of our game, so don't forget that too. So yeah, so um, I wish you all good luck. Please email the Trees for Tribs email address. If you have questions, we will take questions, like I said, at the end after Jeff um, goes through the Grants Gateway with us, which he's going to do right now. And um, we're just really pleased to have you on the call, and we're really pleased to have this grant opportunity offered to, um, to, our, to our residents in New York State. So first of all, for the Grants Gateway, we do have a help desk available for you if you need technical assistance. Of course, it's not going to assist you with how to fill out your grant or, or you know, types of, or the ways to answer your questions, but things like uh, if you need a password reset or you have problems with your user ID or uh, roles or accounts or, you know, just general how to do something technically in the application process. So you can see we have a website, the Grants Reform website that's down here in the bottom. Um, this is uh, for documents, documentation, videos, there's a training calendar which has other webinars. But you can also, uh, right here, go to the grantsreform.ny.gov website, give us an email at grantsgateway at its.ny.gov, or call us 518-474-5595. Someone's there between eight and four every day. Uh, more than just a someone, there's four or five or six people there. So registration, if you're not yet registered in the Grants Gateway, that's where you need to start. So all entities that wish to apply for grants in the state must be registered in the Grants Gateway. This is a paper process, so even though everything else is done electronically, to get signed up, you actually have to fill out a form, print out a form really, fill it out, and then mail it to us. And it's got to be notarized first. So once it's mailed to us, then we'll get you set up in the system. So that could take a few days. Obviously, mailing it might take a few days, but uh, if you don't have what's called a uh, statewide financial system, SFS vendor ID, that takes us two or three days to obtain for you. So if you're just starting from scratch and you've never registered before and you don't have an SFS vendor ID, it could take a good week just to get registered. Um, otherwise, it takes us minutes once we receive your, your registration form to set you up. But again, if your organization is not yet registered in the Grants Gateway, if you've never used it before, that's where you need to start. So information about that is on the portal and the Grants Reform website. Uh, I'll show you where it is in the portal in a few minutes. Pre-qualification. Another part of this is that you have to be pre-qualified if you are a not-for-profit entity. So all not-for-profit organizations in, the, in New York State must be pre-qualified prior to the application due dates. So that would be September 7th, uh, 3 o'clock p.m. So you can refer, again, back to the Grants Reform website for pre-qualification information. Like I said, you have to be pre-qualified by 3 p.m. on September 7th. Your status must be in the status of pre-qualified or pre-qualified open. Governmental entities do not need to worry about this. It's only for not-for-profits. So you certainly can be working on pre-qualification and your application at the same time. That's no problem. Uh, different people will probably be working on them, or maybe, and they're in different parts of the system. So you can certainly work on them both at the same time. They basically both have to be done by September 7th at 3 p.m. However, pre-qualification, when you send in what's called your document vault for us to review, you need to give us uh, five business days to do that. So I would say by September 1st at the latest to submit your document vault for review. So that's beyond what we do here in this webinar, but uh, we do have webinars every Tuesday and Thursday at 1130 that will address that as well. And like I said, the videos and documentation on the Grants Reform website. Okay, so it's important to also understand the user roles. The system is role-based, meaning that whatever, whatever your account's role is, that determines what you're allowed to do in the system. Now, that doesn't mean you can only have one role. You can have as many roles as you want, and that's perfectly fine.
the first person we set up for you on, uh, in your organization when you send in your registration form is the grantee delegated administrator. And usually it's two because we have space for two people's names on the form. And these people can't work in applications, but they can add or edit other user accounts and they can manage pre-qualification, the document vault. So you'll be logging in or somebody at your organization will be logging in with that role, not being able to work on the application, but able to set up people in these other roles. So we'll talk about the grantee role first up here in the top left. And this person can start and edit an application. They can save all the changes in the application, do everything in an application, but cannot submit it. So maybe you have a grant writer or uh, somebody who's on staff but not able to actually submit the application or sign on behalf of your organization, you'd have them in this role. So they can start it, but they can't submit it. The people that can submit, submit the application are these two on the right, the grantee contract signatory, the grantee system administrator. They both pretty much have the same rights, which is all the rights that the grantee has, start, edit, save an application, but they can also submit it. So you need to have somebody in one of these roles on the right here, grantee contract signatory or grantee system administrator, you must have somebody in one of those roles before uh, to be able to be allowed to submit an application. So we often hear people that miss deadlines because they didn't realize it or they didn't forget or they didn't realize they had the wrong role and it comes time to submit and they're running late and they run out of time. So don't get yourselves into that position. Make sure you have the roles set up appropriately ahead of time. That's also mentioned in the RFA. It's mentioned on the grants reform website. Uh, we make it very clear, I believe, with the way the roles are set up. So again, grantee delegated admin can just set things up. They can't work on the application. You need to have somebody in the role of grantee contract signatory or the grantee system administrator. Grantee can certainly work on the application but can't submit it. And it is perfectly acceptable for you or one person to have multiple roles and thus multiple accounts in our system. You can use the same email address. You can even set up the same password. You would just need different accounts. So the way the accounts are set up, it's first initial, last name, and a number. So maybe your msmith10 for one login and msmith11 for another. All right, so what are the next steps? You need to first, of course, make sure your organization is registered in the Grants Gateway. Uh, you can't start an application without that. If you're a not-for-profit, you have to start working on pre-qualification or verify that you are already pre-qualified. Uh, ensure that you have people set up with the right roles, like I said. Download that RFA in its and read it in its entirety. Make sure you're clear with all the requirements. Um, you know, there's a lot of information there. I think there's a lot of homework you need to do before you get started with an application here. Uh, if you have any questions, submit them to the Tree for Tri Trees for Tribs email address. They'll be answered as they come through, and I'll show you where to find those answers. Start your application, uh, obviously the sooner the better. Submit your application prior to the deadline, obviously, but we suggest kind of way prior, you know, 24 or 48 hours. Uh, is a good idea. Sometimes you might try to submit it and you realize you, you missed a question or you forgot something that was required and now you're scrambling at the end because it's 2.57, uh, you're scrambling at the end to get it done. So don't put yourself in that position. We've seen way too many people miss out on grant opportunities because they waited too long. So again, you can start work and you can start and continue to work on both your application and pre-qualification at the same time. All right, so we will get into the gateway and we'll look at, uh, we'll fill out a budget. It's called an expenditure-based budget. Um, you'll complete an itemized budget for all the different items. One thing here that you're going to want to be aware of, if, this, if your application is for multiple projects, you're going to name things accordingly. Uh, you're going to need to name things accordingly in your budget, and I'll show you how I, I'll do that. So that itemized budget should include budget detail and budget narrative cost effectiveness, reasonableness and expense of expenses and eligibility of costs is 20% of the evaluation. And RFA details, the RFA details the eligible and non-eligible costs. You might remember Mary went through those pages a little while ago, at least those slides. This is what the page looks like or one of the uh, entry fields in the Grants Gateway looks like where you would put your description and where you'd put your justification uh, and your amounts. So I'll get in and actually do one as we go through. 
Uh, this is a salary page, looks a little different. You've got a place for their annual salary, how many hours a week they work, how much of that is, uh, is funded for this application or for this project, what is the total amount that you're asking for. This is a bad example because uh, it shows zero here. But. Uh, and eventually when you fill out your budget, this is not a, a real budget that we'd be using here, but uh, it tallies up on the expenditure budget summary page, it tallies up all the different categories that you've added here and will show you what your total project cost is. And what you're asking for, again, is that minimum of $11,000. Work plan is the basis or story of the project. We do provide you that worksheet in the Grants Gateway in the pre-submission uploads. I definitely say you should utilize that because it helps you organize your thoughts and figure out uh, you know, what the different levels of objectives, tasks, and performance measures are. So think of a performance measure as you know, how do we prove that we've, we've accomplished this thing? Do we have a date? Do we have a number of plantings, a number of people? Things like that. So it's nice to have tangible uh, numbers. Quantitative. Um, what else do I want to say on this one? Uh, that's pretty, that's about it on that slide. Uh, there's a work plan overview form. So this allows up to 50,000 characters, which is a lot of text. That's about 12 pages typed in Word. So you can get as detailed as you really need to or want to in the project summary. Uh, you'll find that in the work plan overview form, which I'll show you in a few minutes as well. So again, that's probably something you should map out on uh, Word and you can copy and paste into the Grants Gateway. So this is what it looks like once you submit your application. We've got an objective. You don't really need to be able to read the text here, but just notice that you've got an objective numbered as number one, and then you've got a task. In this case, there's one objective, one task, one performance measure, and then a second objective, a second task. And if we were to be on a second page of this, we'd see the other performance measure. So you need at, so every project needs at least one objective. Uh, it can be one or many objectives. Each objective has one or many tasks, and each task has one or many performance measures. All right, so again, uh, Mary's contact info or the contact info for Trees for Tribs. We'll go first of all to the Grants Reform website. That is grantsreform.ny.gov. Um, this is the website where you can obtain the, on the grantees tab here, links to uh, manuals, videos, things like that. So on the left here is information about uh, the program or the project itself. Here's the grantee user guide to get into the grants gateway. There's resources related to registration and pre-qualification as well. Here's the pre-qualification manual. And we talked about the registration form. That's right here in the top left, registration form for administrator. If I click on that, this is that, that one-page form that I talked about that you have to send to us. So you fill out your name, the address, what type of organization you are, your two people that you want to have the delegated administrator roles. They'll get emails after we process this with their accounts. The head of the organization has to sign it and date it, and then a notary public has to sign it and date it. And if you look on page two, this is the instructions about it and the mailing address down here of where to send it. So that was the registration form for administrator. There's also a videos tab here, which has a video for registration and pre-qualification. The video we're going to make from this will appear on um, uh, the R the question and answer document, I should say. So this video will appear on the question and answers document and then on the website that DEC has as well. So that's grantsreform.ny.gov. And now I'm going to go to the Grants Gateway, which is grantsgateway.ny.gov. And one quick thing, people seem to, some people are still in the habit of typing in www when you go to a website. Don't do that because you'll see, you get this error that says the site is not secure. Uh, we do have a secure website, I guarantee you that, but it's that uh, not under the www version of it. It's just go to grantsgateway.ny.gov, and that's our secure site. We can see that it's got this little lock icon up here showing that it is a secure HTTPS website. All right, so I haven't logged in yet. I'm at the portal. I want to show you what the portal is all about. 
Uh, we'll start from right to left here, registration. There's that registration form again. We can click here to download the form. If you don't have an SFS vendor ID, there's this substitute W9 form you need to fill out as well. If you know your ID and you're not sure if you're registered, type it in here, click this button, and if you are registered, it'll tell you uh, who your delegated admins are. All right, that was registration. Notification. Too late now for this one, but if you wanted to sign up to be notified of any grants that are available or posted, so you put in your name, email address, and select the categories you're interested in. Once you hit sign up, you'll receive emails letting you know when something has been posted in one of these categories. So that is notification. And finally, browse and search. This is how you find the grant opportunities. So we're not logged in. This isn't how you uh, start an application, but here's how you find the RFA and information about it. So I'm going to click on the word search or search now. And it's easy enough to just type for search for the word TRIBS to find it. You could narrow it down if you want to search by the agency and go to DEC or other criteria here, but easy enough to search for the word TRIBS, hit search, and you find it. So, yep, DEC, 2018 Trees for Trips grant program. It's currently available. Here's who can apply for it. It was posted on July 3rd, and it's available for you to apply for up until September 7th. So let's click on this and find out a little more information about it. So it has its own unique ID in the system, DEC01-TFT-2018. This number will become your application number. Every application number is unique ID, so there'll be a five-digit number appended to the end of this. So if you're the first person to apply, it's DEC01-TFT-2018-00001. All right, that's what so you see when I start an application, what it will look like. Again, contact information here. Uh, solicitation profile just gives a few paragraphs about it. Talks about how to apply, which is of course what I'm going to do right now. And it tells you, confirms those roles that need to be logged in to do it. On the right here, some more information. There's that due date again, September 7th at three. Uh, these are two-year contracts, so your budget should accommodate the whole two years. Your plan should accommodate up to two years. They anticipate awards uh, for October 14th, uh, somewhere in October of 2018. And again, your projects can be $11,000 minimum size to $100,000 maximum size. Questions and answers. So remember we talked about the Q&A document that would be uploaded here. Well, it's not uploaded here yet because, of course, nothing has been uh, has been posted yet, but once it is, you can come here, go to this Q&A link, and you can click on it and download the PDF, which will have all the questions and answers. I would suggest you do that up until, you know, the day that you submit your application. So if you submit it on, let's say, uh, September 5th, uh, I would go here on September 5th, just one final click and look at the Q&A document to make sure there's not something you, you're missing. Uh, and this is just who can apply again, the target populations, and environmental supports is what drove that email I talked about, that if you were notified above it, about it, so anybody who signed up for environmental supports would have received that email. All right, one more thing here, or two more things I want to point out. The DEC website for this, you can copy and paste that, which I've already done up here, and you can get into, again, more information about it. Here's the RFA again. Uh, and the details that Mary told you about before. The other thing is right here, you can get to the RFA as well. So I'm back in the grant opportunity portal. I haven't signed in yet, but I can click on view grant opportunity. And I can view the PDF, this RFA, and go through all those 38 pages of it. Again, you really need to do this. You need to, uh, this is where you need to start uh, to get into uh, what you need to do for your program. <clears throat> All right, so I'm not logged in. Let's do that. I'm going to log in so that I can actually go and apply for this. Now, I can't do this in our, our live site, so I'm just going to go to a other site that we have, which is an exact copy here of it. And I'm going to log in as someone in the role of grantee. Okay, so I went to the Grants Gateway, grantsgateway.ny.gov. I have logged in as somebody in the role of grantee. It confirms that I am in that role. And I can do a few things here from this main page. So first of all, the top bar here is kind of uh, reports or, or searching you can do. So there's the portal again. I can search for any applications or contracts that my organization might have. 
Uh, the gateway now allows you to process payments through it on certain new grant opportunities. And if you had that, you would be able to do that as well. Same thing for progress reports. And tasks is something related to the contracting portion of uh, Grants Gateway. If you have a contract with us, you can, you'll receive tasks as things progress through the contract development stages. The black bar here is reference. You've got training materials, information about your organization. This is where your delegated admin would go to set up new users or edit the users. Your personal profile, which you can change your password on or your email address or something, and then log out obviously logs you out. This blue bar I'll refer to as kind of the um, as the action bar. Right now there's just a help button there, but as we go through, there'll be a save button and some other buttons that you can interact with as you're on specific pages. So uh, the rest of the home page is three sections, but we only see two right now. Below the inbox would be a section called My Tasks. I don't have any tasks, but I will later on as I start an application. Your inbox you can ignore. It's just a copy of any email you might have received from the system. Uh, it has no bearing on any of the work you're doing in applications or contracts, so don't worry about that. And this is where you do want to go. You want to go to View Available Opportunities so you can find it and then start an application. So just to recap, to start your application, log in as the right role. From the home page, go to View Opportunities. And you'll search for, for instance, the word TRIBS again. And there it is, 2018 Trees for Trips Grant Program. Now this looks pretty much similar to what we saw in the portal. However, the difference is this. The apply button is right here. So that's how we apply. You do not go through the portal up on top. You go from home to view opportunities, search for it, click on it, and then click on the apply for grant opportunity. All right, so it's starting my application. And I now have a blank application. And you can see I'm the sixth person, person to do this, so I'm application number 00006. So we are brought to what's called the application main page. Think of this as kind of the starting page for everything. There's information on the bottom here of my project title and my project cost. Of course, I haven't entered anything in yet. But everything I enter in is done here on the forms menu. So menu is the page we're on right now. Forms menu are all the forms that you have to fill out and documents you need to provide. Status changes is where we'll be able to send our, uh, stat, uh, submit our application when we're ready. I'll show you a few things here under management tr tools as we go through. And then progress reports and related documents, ignore that. Those are related to contracts if you were to receive a contract. So we're going to go to the forms menu. You notice I can hover over it to see the menu, but it's better if you just click on the word forms menu and see the entire menu in front of you here. All right, so the first two sections are just for your reference only. Contract document properties. If I was to click this, it just shows us the pages or the documents that make up a contract. If you were to receive a contract from the state, there'd be the master grant contract, there'd be the attachment A1, the program specific terms and conditions, a budget, a work plan, a payment and reporting schedule, and that's it. So that page, I'm just gonna hit the back button here, was contract document properties, just for your information, if you were to obtain a contract, that's what it would look like, or that's the template it would look like. Print application we can do later. Here's the RFP again, and here's a link to some instructions. All right, so if I was to click on that application instructions, you can see this document here, and it's tips for it. You can see it's an eight page PDF, and you can get through and uh, get a little more details about how to apply. So this really does go through a lot of the things that I'm about to show right now. All right, application versions, we'll do that after we submit our application. So your work starts here in program information. So you can see program information, the budget, the work plan, and the uploads. All right, so we're gonna go first here to program information and fill out our address. And I'm just going to call this Jeff's Trees for Tribs program. And where are we managing this program out of? And let's say it's at 123 Main Street in any town. That we'll say is in Albany County, and the zip is 12345. 
Now you can see there's these regional councils and agency, re agency specific region. We don't need you to select the regional council, so don't worry about that. That's the um, state, the, the governor's regional economic council. The agency specific region though, we do want you to identify. So I'm just gonna pick region one right now, but I'm gonna show you where to find that in a minute. But I wanted to point out that there are questions that have red asterisks, and if you don't fill out a question with a red asterisk, for instance, I forgot to put in my name, let's say, and you try to hit save, it will save your page, it'll save the information you typed, but you'll get an error here letting you know that you've missed something. So you'll never be able to submit your application until all of these errors, all of these required fields have been filled out. So if I put my project name back in and hit save, I get this green light, the information has been saved, no errors on that page. All right, so besides the agency specific region, there are other things that we're gonna, we're going to need some reference for, and those can be found here if we scroll down in the pre-submission uploads. So I was right here in project site addresses. My suggestion to you though, is to go here, pre-submission uploads, and download these documents and, and templates first to know what you're working with, all right? So the DC regional map, I needed to know what region I was in. I can go here, click on, click here, and you would just click it. I have to, again, do this little extra step because I'm in our test environment. And you can see the regional map, and I, I said I picked region one, well, obviously I should have picked region four here. Okay, so that was the DEC regional map. We've got a work plan worksheet, and I've got one filled out already, or partially filled out that I'll work on later. So you would click here to download that template. Municipal endorsement. If you wanna have a municipality endorse the project, we give you a template to fill out instead of having to type something freehand. That's right here. The eligible watershed map right here. Sample letter of agreement. If you need a letter of agreement, again, if you want us to give you some guidance on it, there's a template here in Appendix 4 for it and a planting plan in here in, project, in Appendix 5. So let me just show you this one. If I go to uh, download it, again, you would just click on it. So this is a planting plan that you can and will need to fill out. All right? So it's a good idea to get here and download these templates or these documents before you get started with everything else. All right. So let's say some time has passed and I've done that. And I can now go in and start working on my, you know, let me fix my address. I'll go back to addresses and I'll fix the region to four and I'll hit save. Now notice there is an add button here. If you had other locations, um, you can click the word add because you can, you're only allowed to do one project. So if you have, uh, or one application I should say. So if you have multiple projects and maybe they're large enough that you want to identify a different uh, location, you can click on the add button and have a blank address and fill that out. So if I do another address, And I'll pick four. Once I've done that, I now have a drop down between the two addresses. Um, so you can do that if you want. I don't know that it's necessary, but that's just what the add button allows for. All right. So uh, one of the big portions of your application process will be this, the program specific questions. So I'm back at my forms menu, down to program specific questions. And these are the questions you need to answer. And if you remember in the RFA, it goes through the evaluation criteria and talks about how well you addressed each one of these questions, how well you answered them. Uh, your score is based on that information. So you give it a project title to start with. Okay, and now you go through and you answer these questions. Some of them are text. Some of them might be numbers or yes, no type questions. Some have uploads. So you can see there's a bunch of different types of questions and answers. 
My suggestion to you is that you get these questions, you can see them in the RFA, and you type them out in Word. Uh, I would definitely do it in Word or something like that so that you can come back and copy and paste your answer here because uh, you can see this allows for 500 characters. So this question number one here is my eligibility. Is my organization a governmental entity, academic institution, or not-for-profit? I can type here. Now this one only has 14 characters, but if I was typing out a question that had a lot of information, you can see as I keep going, it doesn't really allow me to view everything in that box. So yes, on Chrome or Firefox, other browsers allows you to expand it with little handles. Uh, I'm an Internet, Internet Explorer, and it doesn't allow that. So um, just realize that's another reason why you might want to put it in Word first. Okay, so I'm a not-for-profit. Um, please identify the project type, and it's going to be riparian tree planting. Okay, identify if planting projects, uh, are they located on private or public lands? We'll say it's private land, or we'll say it's public lands. Easy enough. Um, if it was public lands, you can put NA here, number four. All right, so now we get into a question that has a lot of text, project summary. So I'll type in my summary. All right, so you can see it counts the characters as I go through. And I'm over 500 right now. If I went to the next field, it gives me an error. I'm over the 500 character limit. So I'll just cut out some of these. And I'm under 500. So obviously you have to be aware of that. If you were to count it in Word, it's characters including spaces. That's how we, how we count the characters. All right, so I'm not going to go through and answer all these. I'm just going to write, here is my answer. Um, this is your job to figure out how you're going to answer it. But I'll say a few things about entering in here. So if we scroll down, we can see there's not a huge amount of questions. There's a good amount, 26 of them. But it's going to take you a while to get in your answers, maybe put in some uploads. So you're going to want to save periodically. So I can click on the Save button right here. And it will give me a whole bunch of errors because I didn't answer 7 through 26. Uh, but at least it saves the information I've done already. So let's say it took a while for me to do that. Maybe it's time for lunch or I have a meeting. I can get out of the system. I could log out. I can log back in, get back to the home page, and I can pick up my application where I left off. So notice on the home page, I mentioned this task field before, which wasn't there before, but is there now. I can open the task and view that application that I was working on. So remember, I was application number six. I can click on it. It's in the status of application in process. And I can go back to the forms menu and continue to work on it. Notice the error because the system knows I saved the page, but I didn't complete everything that was required. So let's do that. All right, here's my answer. And I'm not even reading these, so I'm saying yes or no, and that may be the wrong answer. Some of these have uploads. Some are required uploads, like this one, number nine. So I need to upload a document. And it does mention, do not upload any documents that are password protected, secured, or fillable with a script. The system will not like those types of documents. And when your application is submitted, uh, there's a nice application PDF that's created, and that will fail if you included a secured or password protected document. So that doesn't mean we won't accept your application. It just makes it harder for us to review it. So please don't include password protected documents. But I'm going to go here and from my desktop I have a document, uh, just a random attachment, and I'll attach that. So it's not really attached yet until I hit save. Watch what happens when I hit save. I've got a bunch of errors still, but if I go look at that question, question number nine, it shows now view file. I can view what I've attached here. And if I click on it, I can open it, and you can see it just says the word sample attachment, but yep, that's the attachment I intended to include. So it's, it's a good idea for you to verify what you've uploaded is really what you intended. All right, here's another one, another upload, another answer. 
another upload, another answer, another upload. So that's your planting plan right there. Okay. Plant list. So I'll get that. Any previous history. Now this one is not a required upload number 17, so I don't have to upload something if I don't want to. Notice no red asterisk, or there is a red asterisk here, and no red asterisk here in 17. All right, let's say I've got some, port, some partner support. And again, I'll mention the thing that Mary mentioned several times is a single PDF. So if I had several letters of support or several, um, several things I wanted to combine, I need to combine them in one upload. And then I would hit save because I can't hit save and then go back and upload something else. It would overwrite whatever I put in here for number 18. If I go back now to 18 and hit browse again, I'm not adding a second file. I'm overwriting the first one. All right. So number 19 is our maintenance plan. Number 20 is a summary of the work plan. So there are two summaries of the work plan. There's this one that's 1,000 characters. This is kind of considered the executive summary. And then there's the big one that I mentioned but haven't shown yet that we'll see in a few minutes. All right, are there any outreach and education efforts along with this? Volunteers, maybe I have an attachment for that. Environmental justice. Cost effectiveness, so you have to confirm that um, you have the estimate of the cost per acre uh, and you have um, three competitive quotes from nurseries for the plants you'd like. If you do, you can attach that here. All right, we've got other cost effectiveness questions and I'm gonna not answer number 26. So I'm only not answering it because I wanna show you what happens later on when we try to submit an application with a error on it. All right, so I think I've done this. I've, I think I've answered all the questions. I obviously haven't. I've missed number 26, but we'll ignore that for now. One other thing about working in these pages is there's a timeout in the Grants Gateway system. If you sit here and let's say are typing in this question, you're typing in this question and you get a phone call or someone stops at your desk and then you have to go to lunch and you never hit save, the system will log you out and you lose anything that you hadn't saved yet. So all this uh, gibberish text would be gone, obviously, if I let the system log me out. So to avoid that, just hit save every few minutes. Every five, 10 minutes is good. And when you change the page, it also refreshes that timer as well. All right, so we'll go back to the forms menu and we'll go to the next section, ignoring the fact that I have an error, and we'll go to our budget. So this expenditure budget is broken into these categories, salary, contractual, travel, equipment, other. All right, so we're gonna put out a few things. Let's say we have personal services as well uh, for salary for our staff to uh, obtain the, the trees, obtain the planting. So, um, I don't know the person's position, so I'll just say position A. Something like that. Um, their role responsibility, you know, what are they going to be doing? I'll just put that there. Let's say it's one person. Let's say they make 50000 a year um, and they work 40 hours a week, but we're only funding them, let's say, I don't know, uh, 3% for 24 months, so that would be, do I do 3 for 24? I guess, yeah, so it'll be $1,500. All right, so I'm saying how much of this person's salary is going towards this project. Basically, I'm saying 3% of uh, $50,000. So actually, that probably would be $3,000 since it's 24 months. Now you can see that these categories are not required, but I will tell you that uh, the state controller's office, when they get contracts, they need them to be these to be filled out so they can do the math and make sure it makes sense. All right, so I've just added somebody here for three thousand dollars. Okay, and maybe I really, you know, put in way too much much time for that, but this is just an example of how to work these pages. All right, so not only does every page have a section, like for instance, salary that I just did, 
but there's also a narrative as well. And they want you to fill out the narrative to just explain the exceptions in staffing patterns or salary costs or, you know, what's going on? How did I come up with this number? So I'm typing in the narrative and hitting save. You can see it allows up to 4,000 characters there. All right, so I'll go back to the um, forms menu and I have another section I'm going to put in for uh, other and this is where I'm going to get the actual equipment or the materials. So we can say we have our you know, seedlings for trees to be planted. So what we actually want you to do, I believe, is get into details on it, all right? So uh, you can do something like, for instance, I'm going to put in, uh, let me say, uh, I'm going to put in 25 white oak, 25 red maple, 25 red stem dogwood. Okay, so I need to purchase them. Now, remember, you might have one or two projects or, or multiple projects. So we want you to identify the purchases for each project. So let's say this one is project A, and I'll say swamp white oak. And I might even put in the price at, uh, I'll say, uh, the price per, and I don't know what it is. Let's see. What is it? Bag of 25 is $30. All right. So bag of 25. All right. And I can put in the same thing if you want for your justification. Justification, it should be kind of obvious. Uh, if you ever received the contract, the justification would not show up on it. So the details really need to be here in the description. All right. So I'm asking for uh, what do I want? $30 in that one. All right, so I'll hit save. So that was one item, and I'm going to put in another line. How do I do that? Well, after I hit save, I now have this add button here. So I'll click on add, and I'll do project A, and this will be 25 red maple, let's say. And again, I'll just copy that here, and that is $30 as well. All right, so I've now got two items in expenses. I'll click on Add. And same deal, and that is $20. Okay, so you would keep going. Uh, I'm obviously not going to put a lot more, but I'm just going to, let's add one more line and I'll call it for project B. So I'm just going to lump project B all in one. So you would be uh, separating them, but let's say this is another uh, $120. So since you're combining projects, you really should label things in your budget based on which project they're referring to. All right, so um, I have also have some other equipment that I need. So I need things like five-foot stakes. Uh, and I'll say 75 at dollar fifteen each, something like that. All right, I might want to say project A, something like that. Okay, we're going to purchase them and it's going to be uh, eighty six twenty five. All right, I'll put in another line. We'll call this tree tubes. Um, I'll say 50 at $2 each. So that's going to be $100. So you get the point here. As you add in different line items, um, it's going to keep adding it up to your total. 
So um, you've got things like the trees and shrubs you're going to buy, the materials you're going to buy. You've got, you know, things like weed mats, um, staples. There's a lot of other things you can put in here. You want to delineate by the different project names. You need to put in um, probably a whole bunch of different line items. You know, if you've got a large project, you might go here. I'm going to go for project B. Let's say we've got 5,000 stakes uh, at $1.15 each. And that one is going to be 57.50. All right, so I already had 186.25 in this category, but now I've got 59.36.25. All right, so maybe I'll add, I'll go back in here to my forms menu back down to other and um, now you know what I'll do I'll go to contractual so you might have uh, people that you're con contracting with so an arborist maybe the name of it all right and the reason why if you can fit that and um, maybe you figure out the number of hours you need or something like that. And I'll just put in, I don't know, $1,500, let's say. I have no idea what uh, a good amount would be. But let's take a look at our forms menu here. And let's go down to the expenditure summary and see how things are adding up. So you can see I've got 3,000 here in salary. I've got 1,500 in contractual, 5,936. I've got a project of 10,636.25. Now, obviously, I'm not done yet, and obviously, I'm below the $11,000 project, so um, I'm not ready to go yet. I'll add a few more items, or I'll add one more item. I think you're all probably getting the picture of how to do it. Every section, you need to fill out the line items, and you need to fill out the narrative. I didn't do an equipment narrative or other narrative, um, but I'll just put in other. And I'll do one more line, and I'll just call it a bunch of other things. You'll be a little more detailed than that. All right, and let's say this is, um, I don't know, $19,000. All right, so a couple things we can look at here. First of all, every category has this category total summary. And it's not a bad idea for you to verify what all your categories add up to individually by clicking this button. It's going to want you to open up an Excel sheet. You can say open and OK or yes. And it's showing me all the things I put in here for this category. And I've got my project A, my project B, a bunch of other things. And you can see it all adds up to my total cost of 19200 All right. So, uh, what you're doing here is verifying, yep, I got everything, and yep, it adds up to the amount that I expected it to. So you do have to do that, unfortunately, on each individual one. Uh, you don't have to do it, but I think it makes sense to verify, especially something that has so many different line items. You're going to want to make sure that you've covered everything. All right, so at the end of that, we look at that expenditure summary again, and you probably have already filled out a budget on a worksheet, you know, somewhere you have in mind a budget, and this should this should equal that number. Yep, my projects both all combined, we're supposed to be twenty nine thousand six hundred thirty six dollars. Oh, someone was telling me his screen is frozen, but it looks fine now. Um, so for those that missed it, I went to the forms menu, I went to the expenditure summary, and I'm just verifying that. Yep, my project cost is exactly what I expected it to be. So I'm done with my budget. Obviously, I'm not. I didn't do a bunch of narratives, uh, but for this case, we'll say we're done. Next section is the work plan. All right, so we've got the work plan overview form. And it starts out with a work plan period. Let's say mine is going to be from 3-1-20-19 to 2-28-20-21, two-year period. And then you've got that uh, project summary. Again, something I strongly suggest, you write it in Word. You might have bullet points and character uh, or um, paragraph spaces. It'll retain all that information. And then you copy and paste it into this field. 
Of course, you may have multiple projects. So you can see as I go and copy and paste, it counts the number of characters. Organizational capacity, basically, how are you able to uh, accomplish this? How does your organization have the background and the people and the training to accomplish what you need to do here? So this, if you ever to, were to receive a contract, this would not end up on the contract, but the project summary would, and of course it would be editable at time of contract development. So we'll hit save on that page. That's easy enough. At least for me to copy and paste, you'll have to write a bunch of text. All right, but we're not done here because the next part is the forms menu objectives. And that's where the high level objectives for the work plan start. So, we wanted to do a work plan template, a work plan, uh, we give you a template and we think it's a good idea for you to fill it out. And remember, let me go back here, that was in pre-submission uploads under work plan worksheet. All right, so I've downloaded it, I've filled it out, or at least parts of it, and this is what it looks like. So I could have written my overview here. And then here is uh, one objective for a project I'm working on. So what is the high level goal? Objective, a repairing buffer and 50 foot buffer on town land. You know, you probably wanna say the name or the location or you know, your project A versus project B. What are some of the tasks or the milestones? So we've got partner support. We've got the project plan. We have to finish the project plan. So each one has, in my case, three, well I've got three performance measures here and two performance measures here. So we've got one objective, two tasks, task A has three performance measures, task B has two performance measures. You can go through and add as many objectives, tasks, or performance measures you want. So we'll start with the objective, repairing buffer and 50 foot buffer on town land. All right, so let me go back into the gateway, back to my application, and remember we're in the work plan section under objectives. So my first objective is this, and then I can give a description if I want. Notice description is not required in this field, but I'll hit save. And now that I've saved the description of my objective, I can add another objective, another high level objective, or this is the one place you have to hover on the forms menu. I hover on the forms menu and notice I can go to tasks. So let's go to that second level. So for the repairing buffer and 50 foot buffer on town land objective, what are my tasks? Well, one of them is partner support. So I'm gonna do partner support, and then I'm gonna put in my explanation here. Obtain support from partners, highway department, municipality, et cetera. You know, whatever text you have. And then hit save. Okay, so for that task, I now can hover over the forms menu and go to the performance measures. So it's blank, but here's the objective, the task, and now if I go to the performance measures, I need municipal endorsement. And what's the narrative of that? I'm going to talk to the municipality and obtain an endorsement. You know, really you might want to be a little more, uh, a little more detailed and you might want to be kind of quantitative and say, you know, endorsement obtained by, you know, 6-1, if I can type right, 2019. So you can see there's an option for an upload as well. Most people probably won't use that, but maybe there's a specific form or document you're referring to. You can include that if you wanted to. All right, so I added, if, let's go back to my worksheet. One objective, one task, one performance measure. But I've got two other performance measures here. So one is called partnership. I'm still on performance measures. I can click on add, and I've got another performance measure here. And this is obtain partnership with local watershed group and local trout unlimited. All right, so I've hit save. I now have two performance measures. I'll go add my third. I click the add button. I go back and copy, so volunteers. and identify X number of volunteers to help dig holes for tree planting. Okay, so what am I left with now? 
one objective, one task, and these three performance measures. But remember, I have another task. Let's go back to the forms menu and back to tasks. And I click on add. And now I'm in a second blank task. So that was this, the project plan. And here's the description of it. And I'll hit save. And I can now go toggle between the two different tasks if I wanted to. But I'll stay on project plan and, met, and add performance measures for this one. So I click on performance measure. I'll go grab one. And this one is the regional forester. And this one I have a date. You know, I want to identify it by a certain date. And I'll hit save. Okay, so, you know, I've got the other one, but I think you probably get the point how it works now. So the idea is uh, you have to navigate through the forms menu, and you have to have your objectives, tasks, performance measures, and you can navigate backwards. I can go back to objectives, and since I only have one objective, I can click on add and add a second high-level objective if I wanted to, and then go in through there and put in my tasks and performance measures as well. So you'll see when we submit our application how it lays out in the application PDF, which ends up looking a lot like this worksheet that we had. All right, almost done here. Back to the forms menu. We'll go down and go to the pre-submission uploads and anything that we need to attach, we put in here. We can see, remember, everything that we saw here were templates for us. We don't need to provide them. We've provided them in our program specific questions, or we just use them as our own uh, reference. There's nothing you need to click on browse and attach here. So don't worry about that. All right, and finally is the grantee document folder. You may not ever use this, um, and we don't want you to just to start randomly putting things in here, but this document folder is for uploading other documents that uh, for whatever reason you might think are required but you didn't have a place for. So you just put in the name, click Browse, and hit Save, and you would be able to attach it. You could hit the Add button and add another and so on. Again, we don't really want you to abuse that section. We don't want uh, applications that are hundreds and hundreds of pages long. Uh, but if for whatever reason you need a place to upload something else, that's a way to do it. That's not a replacement for you not being able to uh, attach uh, – create in PDFs in one PDF. We really want you to try to do that. Um, but if necessary, it can be done there. All right. So I think I'm done. We know I'm not because I have an error here on this page. But remember, I can't submit this. I'm only a grantee. I'm not a grantee contract signatory. If I wanted to add this as a task for someone in my organization that I know is the signatory and I want to make it easier for them to find the application, I can go to Management Tools and Add Edit People, and I can go find that person. And the person I want here is Barbara Signatory. She's going to be the one to sign in and actually submit this application. So I went to Management Tools, Add Edit People, I checked her name, and I hit Save, and now when she logs in, she'll be able to see this as a task. That doesn't mean she couldn't have seen it anyway before, because if I log out, and I log in as her, She does have the task down here, we can see, but anybody can also go to Applications and search for the application this way as well. So I know the word TRIBS is in there again, or I know maybe my application number six or whatever. I can hit on Search and find the application and get into that as well. All right, so you don't have to have a task in order to get into it. I went back to my home page, but you can go to Applications and search for it, or in this case, Barbara does have the task. She can go to My Tasks, open the tasks, and click on the application. So she can go through and add or edit all those pages that we just saw. Maybe she would notice this error. I hope she would. One thing you can do here is this print application. If you want to do a review on one page, you click that button, and it'll ask me to print it, which I don't want to do right now, but you could. Uh, but you can see all those questions and answers, all of my answers here, all of my budget line items are here, my contract summary, my 
budget summary down here. My work plan, you can see I had that big long uh, summary. So all the details you put into your application are here, except for any uploads. If I go back up to the program specific questions, it says that in fact there is an upload here for number 18, but it doesn't show me what it is. So if you wanna double check that, and I strongly suggest that you do, you really go into the program specific questions itself and you click on view file to verify that what you uploaded is really what you intend to be as part of your application. All right, so I strongly suggest you do that. And let's say Barbara is doing that and she's, re she's reviewed everything and ready to submit it. All right, again, we know this error is here, but we're going to ignore it. So what happens if I try to submit this with an error? Submitting it, let's just verify where we are. We're in the status of application in process. It's prior to September 7th right now. And we're gonna to go to status change and submit the application by clicking this apply status button. And I click it and of course I get an error saying, wait a minute, question number 26 uh, requires an answer and you didn't do that. So I can click right on it, go back down to number 26 and say, oh yeah, here's what I meant to answer and I can answer it. All right, so if I go back to the forms menu, obviously that error is gone. And we can see um, that Jeff Grantee is the first person to save it and Barbara Signatory just fixed it at 11.58. Now we're ready. So again, our status is in application and process. I'm going to go to status changes and apply the status of application submitted. It basically asks you to affirm you're, you're allowed to submit on behalf of your organization. Uh, you haven't given your password away, that kind of stuff. And I click on I agree, and it will submit my application. And that was it. So how do I know it's been submitted? Well, that status has now changed. It's now the status of assignment of reviewers, whereas before it was application in process. Uh, in a matter of seconds, I'll receive an email confirming that I, re I submitted it, so that's good. And of course, the task that we had before, if I go to home, is no longer there. I don't have any tasks. That doesn't mean I can't find my application. I can go back to applications. I can go back to search for it, find it, and note that it's in assignment of reviewers, and I can't now go in and make changes. So, yeah, I can go to a question, and I could type over if I wanted to, but there's no save button because it's already been submitted. All right, so if you did submit it, and you have, let's say, a week left or five day, or three days left or something, and you realize, oh, I want to edit that, you can call our help desk and we could send it back to you for you to edit. Uh, you just obviously would be, uh, be aware that you'd have to resubmit it before the deadline or else it would never be submitted again. All right, so one last thing to do is you want to look at the application versions. Uh, it's not there yet, I can tell because of the icon, but uh, that will show my whole application in one big PDF and uh, we'll give it another minute. Uh, one other thing I want to point out, back to the menu page. It does summarize your project here, so your project title, your <clears throat> the grant funds you're requesting. Forms menu, application versions. We can see Barbara submitted it at 11.58. If I click on the link, I can view it. And again, page one is my overview or my cover page. I was application number six. Here's my project name, the amount. Uh, this is just what I attested to when I signed it and submitted it. Remember I had two addresses, so here they are. And here's the answer to my questions. So I answered number one like that, number three, number five, and so on. And remember, some of them had attachments. Number nine had an attachment. So how do I know which attachment, uh, or, or how do I see the attachment? We'll see that in a few minutes after I scroll past these. So after I scroll past the um, program-specific questions, here are those attachments. So here's the one for, let's say, question number nine. Here's the one for another one. Obviously, these are just blank, <clears throat> but yours would be the real PDF attachment. So. Some of these may be, you know, 5, 10, 15 pages. So I've got a good number of attachments here. 
And then I get to the budget, there's the summary. The line items, here's salary. And it goes to the line item, the justification, and the narrative for each one. All right, so contractual, one line item, one justification, and I skipped the narrative so it's not there. Equipment, we had three here, three justifications, and there would be one narrative. And the same thing for other, and then my project summary or my work plan comes up next. So there's the work plan project summary. And here's my work plan. So objective one, the name of it, the description if I had one, task one, name, description, performance measure, name, description, and so on. Task 1.2, name, description, performance measure 1.2.1, name, description. So you can see it comes out a lot easier to read here in your application uh, than what you're doing in the work plan in the uh, forms menu. All right, and then finally, there's our organizational capacity. And after that would be any other attachment we provided that wasn't in the program specific questions. And in my case, <clears throat> that would be none. So there's nothing else here. All right, so that is it.